Hey everyone, so today instead of talking to you myself, I decided to bring in an expert on the topic. Uh, this is my colleague Bess Myers. She works here in the Comparative Literature Department and has her master's in classics, which means she works in ancient Greek and Roman texts. So when I wanted to talk with you about the Odyssey, I turned to Bess. Hey Bess, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. So a lot of the students uh, taking this course have probably heard of the Odyssey, um, maybe even if they didn't know that they've heard of the Odyssey. Uh, but I was wondering if you could tell us what the Odyssey is and why it's important. The Odyssey is one of two um, epic poems uh, from what we know as Homer. So we have the Iliad, which concerns the Trojan War and the fall of Troy. And the Odyssey essentially picks up where the Iliad leaves off. So Troy's fallen, and the Greeks need to get home. Odysseus is our main character, and we meet him a little bit in the Iliad. He's a great speaker, he's persuasive, um, he's a good fighter and a good leader. But now we're seeing him on his 10-year journey to return to Ithaca. The Odyssey was probably composed in about the 8th century BCE. Scholars dispute as to exactly when it might have been composed. Um, but essentially, it was composed orally at first and passed down as this kind of mythical story about Odysseus's return. In about the 6th century BCE, um, Pisistratus, he made it a rule or a practice that every year at the uh, Panathenaea, which was the big annual festival in Athens, um, that the Iliad and the Odyssey were performed in contests um, by rhapsodes who were these performers. Um, and so the story of the Odyssey has a very weighty cultural significance, clearly because of its importance being performed at this annual uh, religious and cultural, essentially like week-long party festival uh, in Athens. Um, but as to whether people actually thought that the story of the Odyssey was true, um, it kind of varies from yeah. account to account. Um, but basically, it's a really uh, important text that at least uh, somehow communicated to people um, about the role of the gods in the world, about gender roles and what a good man is and a good woman, um, and uh, sort of taught and passed on these moral um, ideas. And it becomes deeply important then as well when we get into the medieval era and later when mm -hmm. people who are scholars and writers um, end up getting their start by translating these older texts and the Odyssey is one of them and so it becomes this kind of iconic text not just in ancient Greece but to you know a lot of important philosophers thinkers and writers yeah and it's still a required text in in high schools today in a lot of parts of the world um, it's it's hard to underestimate the importance of the Odyssey to what we might consider the Western canon or Western culture part of our understanding of what literature is now is based on religious texts that we've encountered for generations and generations. I think the Odyssey is also important to the way that we read now. So when I read Odyssey for the first time earlier um, this summer, I thought it was really great and really enjoyed it. And I followed the author Matt Fraction's work before, so I had some idea of what I was expecting. Uh, I've also read the Odyssey in high school. But not only did I think it was really cool, but I wanted to talk with somebody about what it was doing with the original Odyssey story. So I contacted Beth and said that she should read it, and, uh, and then we should talk about it. And she was game. She actually did. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so grateful that you did contact me because it's been, well, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it's, it's just an amazing, awesome um, text. And tell the class a little bit about uh, what this... Uh, this comic text, Odyssey, um, is doing with the original story. I mean, there's the obvious sort of gender flip and the sci-fi flip, but um, there's a lot more going on. And I was curious if you could talk about some of the things that you think are most interesting about the ways that this gender-bent sci-fi comic deals with this original um, epic poem. Sure. Um, so first of all, I guess I should reveal that I'm not someone that reads comics really at all, which is not... Uh, 
an ethical choice, like I think they're bad or wrong. <laughs> I, it's just not something that comes up very often for me. So reading this was a real experience in encountering um, both a text that I'm fairly familiar with and a kind of text that I really don't encounter very much at all. Um, I think it would have been so easy just to change the gender of every character and have a story about Odyssea um, and her crew of women um, that was much more simplistic about gender roles and really just inserted women into what we might consider a traditional male role. Um, and Odysseus in the Odyssey does uh, embody what we might think is a traditional male. Oh, he's um, like the perfect man. He is the perfect man. He's cunning, uh, he's violent, he's crafty, he loves his wife. Um, and so I think it would have been so easy just to put the women in these male roles and leave it at that. In the Odyssey, Odysseus uh, weeps for his wife and his son and misses them. He's allowed to be violent when he attacks the Cyclops. He's cunning, but he's also sensitive when he returns home and, um, and can't embrace Penelope right away. And so what I like about the characters in Odyssey is that they are also permitted to be not only violent and not only intelligent, but also we see Odyssey weeping and really sad about missing her son. And instead of just sort of uh, inserting them into male roles, that they are also very much females and feminine. Mm -hmm. And there is a real um, focus on womb imagery mm -hmm. and like uterine imagery and birth and the sort of female anatomy, mm -hmm. which I think was also um, something that stood out to me as yeah. like very special and important. Yeah, and I find it interesting too with some of the womb imagery and some of the some of what happens with the, the gender switching isn't just how we read it in Odyssey, but the ways in which it kind of makes us rethink the original text in interesting ways, right? Like some of the womb imagery isn't really made up for Odyssey. It's just the same thing, but because it's all women and, and we're sort of trying to think of it in a different way, we see it more clearly. But then we go back to the Cyclops and start thinking about it as weird birth and these kind of things. Um, or, you know, we question how we responded to Zeus when he's a man because of how we might respond to the same exact actions when we see this character now as a woman. I do think that that's a really great point, that what I think Odyssey lets me do, at least as a classicist, is it does illuminate some of the material in um, the original text, like uh, the, uh, the womb of a ship holding mm -hmm. its crew comes out very clearly in Odyssey. And although language like that does appear in uh, the original text, it, Odyssey illuminates those mm -hmm. aspects, um, which I think as uh, someone that you know, has read a lot of the Odyssey in Greek. It's just awesome to see this, this new, wonderful take on it. One of the things that I'm still struggling with uh, processing Odyssey is the character Zeus. Mm -hmm. And it's something I'm still thinking about because Zeus in the Odyssey is angry and violent and very masculine. Mm -hmm. And in Odyssey, she's allowed to be lonely and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I thought that choice was particularly fascinating also. And I'd, I'll be interested to see how that character develops as well. Because uh, she's wrathful yeah. and rash and uh, makes decisions with really serious uh, effects. But we also see her alone, mm -hmm. and we we don't encounter a, a Zeus like that in the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things that I'm I'm still processing, and I'll be really interested to see how that character develops over time. So one last thing I want to talk about that we talked about a little bit um, earlier when we were having a conversation uh, about Odyssey originally was the sort of the language of the narrator. 
Um, there's a very clear narrator in the Odyssey. And one of the things that they're most known for, particularly this narrator, are the turns of phrase and the kinds of um, adjectival phrases attached to characters and things. Uh, Rosy-fingered Dawn being one of the most famous. Um, so the narrator in the comic is really interesting because of the way it kind of is playing with that. And and you had some um, some thoughts about what was going on with, with those. Yeah, so one of the parts of Odyssey that I found probably more accessible to me than maybe the general population uh, was the kind of register or language used. And what I noticed as I was reading um, is that there's a real contrast between uh, the sort of narrative voice that we hear, this sort of poetic, condensed um, voice versus the more conversational aspects when you see characters interacting with one another. And um, so this was something that I found actually fairly familiar, but I imagine that many readers uh, find sort of distancing because the language is quite common um, in the original text. So one of the things that I found uh, really interesting and beautiful with Odyssey was the uh, choice of epithets for um, Odyssey especially. Mm -hmm. um, so in uh, the Odyssey, there are, um, as you mentioned, these sort of phrases attached to different um, events or objects, wine dark sea mm -hmm. is a common one, um, rosy fingered dawn. Uh, and Odysseus is described as a variety of things, but in the very first line of the Odyssey in Greek, he's described as um, polutropos, which can mean, it means many, many ways, mm -hmm. but it can also sort of from that mean wily or cunning or like opportunistic. So the epithets attached to Odyssea, um, I, the ones I remember, I think like witch wolf, mm -hmm. um, witch jack comes up pretty early, wife lord, um, how those epithets distill parts of her character and tell us about her, um, I thought uh, was just a really brilliant and beautiful way to communicate aspects of her character. Um, that also maintained a kind of um, relationship with the original text. Yeah, there's a continuity, but then there's also that sort of switch of gender again, because when we think of witch, um, or wolf witch, for example, is a particularly interesting one, or witch wolf, um, you know, those are two relatively negative connotations, especially attached to women, whereas it's always relatively positive, uh, this notion that Odysseus is cunning and clever and, and, and tricky. Uh, but there is some recuperation because we, we do see Odyssey as the hero. Um, so we at least we begin to associate those, with, uh, associate those with a positive connotation, even though the words themselves have possibly a negative connotation, um, which is an interesting way, again, of kind of rethinking and reworking what it means to actually switch genders in this kind of context. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, come and chat with me for a little while and putting your face in front of my students. I hope they appreciate it. They should. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your having me. I love talking about the Odyssey, and I really appreciated that you uh, made me aware of this text that I, I might not have otherwise read. And I have been telling people about it. Yeah. So. Good. See? So you can talk to your friends about it at a party and yeah. be the new cool kid. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. See you, everyone.